uh, at the show. So, Barry, welcome. I'd like you to introduce yourself. Well, um, what should I tell you? I've been doing this for 52 years in the Toronto area. And um, in my career, I've crisscrossed North America so many times I can't recall how many trips. I've worked about everywhere. And um, I'm an active agent the last seven years with Remax Ultimate and a Hall of Fame realtor. But I also have lectured to thousands of agents across North America. But most important about tonight, um, like I said, I told you in private before, if I took off my shirt and show the whip marks for the scars that I have that I've earned from the downturn and the crashes of 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s, when real estate, we weren't in a recession. The economy was in a recession. Real estate was in a depression. And I've seen what happens and the domino effect and how it all starts. Yeah, well, uh, we apologize to our audience for some technical delay at the TV sh uh, TV uh, station. Well, they had to let me out of the home. Yes. Now, we have, um, uh, as you know, we are predicting uh, uh, a recession because of employment, some uh, projection uh, given by uh, TV and other institutions that if we have uh, two consecutive uh, uh, quarters of no growth or negative growth in GDP, we will be uh, we will be in recession. But we are technically in recession, but we have not uh, met the, the benchmark yet. But as you can see, there are thousands of people who have purchased the property. Uh, and they're going to be closing it uh, in, 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 in the next uh, couple of months. As you know, that uh, Korea has said 60,000 people across Canada bought it, and there are 120,000 buyers and sellers. So considering all those circumstances, what do you see that this recession or uh, will or this coronavirus impact will have on uh, real estate? So well, to, first, uh, first of all, what happens in Toronto is not the same that happens in Windsor or in Sarnia or up in Sudbury. Every community has a different level. Yes. That has to be the first thing. There's no such thing as an average that what affects one community affects another. I'll give you an example. When Toronto was recovering, certain other communities weren't back in the 90s. Um, a case in point, the Sterling Truck Company went out of production in St. Thomas, Ontario. That was the big, one of the big employers, the automotive industry. So they got hit bad. Toronto, Toronto, Brampton, Toronto, greater Toronto area, is a diverse economy. No matter what happens tomorrow, no matter how bad things are getting, people are gonna show up to lecture at Ryerson or U of, U of T. They're gonna work in the university healthcare network they're going to work for the Ontario legislature and all the different government agencies. And they're going to work in the head offices, even though it'll be less people, of the major corporations. Toronto is a different economy by itself. It's a city state. Could there be problems within Toronto? Absolutely. But the problems in other communities are going to be depending on the impact to be greater, depending on the employer and who stays or doesn't stay in business. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it's true. You know, we have a symptoms of a recession, even though it's not an officially uh, reception. We have uh, overvaluation, which is, I call, we call it a bubble. People think that there is a bubble in real estate because price has gone up. And also supply side shock, because as you know, in Saudi Arabia, they're giving her more oil. There is no demand. They're increasing the production. There also is a demand uh, uh, side weaknesses where the consumer, lack of consumer uh, confidence. Yeah. So these are the signs that, that, that we are in that uh, direction that we're going there. And uh, the real symptom of recessions are unemployment, because you know, there is a lockdown and right now across the country, basically. 
uh, people are being laid off and the government of Canada has put $105 billion to support the businesses and, uh, and unemployment. Uh, so how we see this, that we come out from coronavirus, I hope we are able to cur uh, uh, curtail this uh, uh, spread of virus. How do you see that is going to be impact on people who wants to buy the house? Because we knew in, in February, we have almost 15% increase in sale from the last February 2019 to, uh, to February 2020. So how do you see that? Well, first of all, I'm not a stats guy, and I'll explain the reason why. I don't like averages. When I hear prices have gone up 10%, 5%, really? Every neighborhood in every city is different. So averages don't work. Some neighborhoods go up like crazy, others don't. And all we have to do is look at certain maps. And I've been lucky. I've worked in most of the major cities in Canada. And you, you define a price changes by neighborhood, not by averages, because when a million, multi-million dollar home sells and the most basic 200 something thousand dollar house in certain communities sell, how do you average that? Then the average house is five, you know, what is it, a million to $600,000? That doesn't make sense. Averages don't make sense. I don't like them. I don't use them. I, if I have to do an analytical, I go into the neighborhoods specifically because what happens in a Rosedale in Toronto is not the same as what's happening in Whitby, and yet you're averaged in. I don't I, like I, I absolutely agree because uh, the prices are uh, very specific to the demographic. For the neighborhood and, and the strata and the strata because if you've got – Single family detached, they should have to be compared to single family detached. And then you've got to start looking at what type of houses are selling. I'll give you an example of a house that's gone out of favor over the years. The 1950s, 1960s split level. I know somebody's listening to this. I live in a split level. I love it type of thing. They're not popular anymore. But if I had to compare, if I had to compare a split level, I'd do a study of split levels and where they're going. So you've got to look at, at, at the product itself and what's happening. But to hear, I'll go backwards from what your question is, okay? Yes. This is not about the virus. It, yes. it, it is the virus. This is a perfect storm. The perfect storm in the movie were two storm fronts hitting at exactly the same time. We've had the uh, stock market. The stock market's gone volatile. Do you know how many people you know how many pensioners had their money invested and they, and they were drawing on that money, using that money for retirement? And how many people, I bump into people, I've had people tell me, I'm not buying, I'm not doing anything now. We can't afford it because their yeah. stocks have taken a hit. Then you get the virus. So you've got a double whammy here. You know, yeah. so people are going to be, look, at, we're going to go into it. We've never been here before. Ever, not yeah. in our lifetime. This is the first time that uh, I have seen that uh, everything is totally shut down, and you are working from your home. Like this broadcast is live from our homes, and uh, it had never happens that uh, that uh, in a, in the history. So this is very extreme condition, and uh, and thankful. We're going to be thankful. We can do this. Yeah. We can do this. We could never do this before. If we were shut down, first of all, let's be thankful here. Let's, let's, let's be realistic. We're not in December and January yeah. where it's getting dark at 4.30 and our moods are bad. The yeah. sun's up later, yeah. number one. Number two, it's getting a little warmer. And we're not going through the, a bad winter. Let's also be thankful that I can go over and you have the ability to press a switch and somebody is providing us with electricity. It's not invisible. That electricity is because somebody's working in a plant right now to make sure that everything's going so we can have electricity, so we can do this. This is a wonderful time to be alive. Yeah, you see, I, I think now because we are isolated, we have a more uh, opportunity to educate ourselves, oh. find uh, doing things differently, remotely, and I encourage our fellow realtors as well to sign up for some courses, get your education, increase your skill set. Because this is the best time that you are able to 
spend quality time at home and also learn and also do things differently. Because uh, yesterday I was talking about remotely showing the house. We as seller might have to cooperate uh, because uh, we cannot send a buyer to your house because we, unless you sign the affidavit that uh, there's no contamination in the house and nobody is sick. So there was a lot of uh, guidance, uh, some I, I mentioned yesterday in my broadcast. So how do you see this now? 99.9% nobody showing houses and people are I, I, had, the house. I, I had a showing today. Yeah, how did you do that? Not me, but I had a, I have a vacant luxury condo, and we had a fight, not a fight, we had to coerce the management to let us in the elevator, did not talk to anybody. A neighbor opened the door before half an hour before my clients, the, the, pardon me, the other agent's clients got there. They came oh. to, a, the door was open. They walked in, no keys, nobody touched anything. They went into a vacant apartment, no furniture. And they toured it. And then when they left, the neighbor came back an hour later and locked the door. I got lucky. So okay, they're showing. Like there's, and there's sales. There's one company I know did 60 deals this week. Yeah. No, uh, I think you know, I, I am dealing with some projects at their site, new development, where all plans and specs are with us. So we don't have to show. They can go to the lot and they see the lot outside, right? So that those are, the, I'm suggesting people who, if they are, working with the new developers and that would be a, a possible scenario where you only rely on the, the, the specs, artist uh, design concept and, and everything else. Now here is uh, one thing I mentioned yesterday in my broadcast where the seller before he lists the property has to declare some sort of a affidavit or some kind of a part of the listing agreement that nobody in the house has a virus, uh, nobody has traveled overseas uh, or coming from overseas for the last 21 days, uh, 14 days if there's somebody came in, has to be quarantined, something like this. And also give affidavit that if anybody show the house and somebody gets sick, are you going to give us a protection for that? So what do you think of that? I, I, I'm going to say this, for some people, these are desperate times they have to sell. Part of what I do, I've probably been involved, I've done over 600 trials as an expert witness. Yeah. And a large part of my, um, I, in two areas, first is real estate stigma, and there's, there's a, I'm going to be on a seminar for somebody else about will houses where people had had the virus in the house, will that house become stigmatized? Well, it's kind of ridiculous because the virus doesn't last forever. It, it, it only has a certain life on the surfaces, but we leave that alone. The other is agents that screwed up and get sued. I do a lot of jobs against agents. With that scenario that you're looking at, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but people lie. They're desperate to sell their house, and they lie. Yes. You have no idea what goes on. The lies out there. When we did, when I got involved with urea formaldehyde. We yeah. had people swear on affidavit. It's in the offer. Swear. We never had urea formaldehyde. Then we found out uh, through my detective work, they went and appealed their taxes two years earlier to get a reduction because they had urea formaldehyde. <laughs> so the people lie. Of course they lie because they're desperate. They figure you won't know. So no, but those safeguards, here's the other thing. I'm not sure about errors and emissions insurance for some of the stuff that we're doing as realtors, if it's going to cover us. I think it's only covered $50,000, I believe. But it's not just that. An agent who's desperate for a commission, doesn't tell anybody, he's not feeling well. Turns out the only person that went into that house um, during the um, um, time, the only showing was that one agent with his two clients. They were wearing all the protective gear, everything. And those people in the house got very violently sick. Maybe somebody died. What if they can prove that it was the agent that was sick? You think area yeah, admissions is going to con contact, look after it? Yeah. I, I spoke to uh, one of uh, my lawyers, uh, one of the lawyers, and he said that if an agent go and show a property and something happens to the buyer, it, 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 the, the buyer agent is subject to 
liability. And uh, so, 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 so every lawyer who says one thing, there's another lawyer suing on the other side. Remember yeah. that. So <laughs> the, the problem is because we have a very uh, unusual uh, situation. And uh, so I kind of drafted a couple of uh, clauses for the buyer when we are listing with the listing uh, uh, seller to make sure that we have assurance at least we have a piece of paper that will be a part of our listing agreement. Same thing when somebody is asking us to confirm an appointment, they have to sign something to confirm certain things that we put put out. And once they do that, then we'll give them access to the house. Otherwise, I, uh, I don't disagree with any of that. But come, let's come back to recession. The word recession, yeah. okay? Yeah. I know one one thing. I'm a I'm a student of economics because I've been caught. Yeah. You, you've got to understand. I've owned hundreds and hundreds of homes in my life. Yeah. And I ended up with nothing at the end because I got caught in different markets where the markets crashed. Yeah. And I, I, I've seen where I've been a millionaire in one moment and wiped out the next. I know what it's like to be in trouble. Number one, I look at the papers all the time, constantly, for bankruptcies. And bankruptcies have been up the last months in Canada. Bankruptcies have been up. Number two, I look at the next factors, three factors. Number two, I look at unemployment. Unemployment hasn't okay. been bad. Yeah, but we're the now problem. projecting 13%. Yeah, go tell that to people in the restaurant business. They won't yeah. even be close to 13. 13% will be a low in the restaurant, in the service industry. Now the next factor, the killer, is there's one little component that's missing from the, the three of them. Yeah. Mortgage rates. Yeah. We have mortgage rates that our great grandparents never saw. We're not, we don't have money. We have, this is, I've argued for years, this is not mortgage money. This is cheap rental of money. Yeah. That allows people to overpay for a house because the carrying costs are cheap. But, and interest rates do not appear to be going up. So the one thing that's the gravity that's holding everything back right now is the cheap money. Because if mortgage money wasn't cheap, for, we, not, we would be over the edge. Yes. It's what's holding us back from, a, from chaos. Yeah. Is that it, but if a person loses their job, they're going to lose their house. There are going to be, I'm going to, I'll give you a scenario. Do you want me to give you the domino effect of how it starts? Yeah, of course, of course. I'll start with the domino effect. The first person, person to be affected by a negative um, economy is the infill builder. The guy who comes along, tears down the little bung 1950s bungalow in a neighborhood, rips it down, either builds a two-story on top of the bungalow or rips it right down to the foundation. Yeah. They're paying about 14, 15% for their money, interim financing. So the thing is that you, I, I mean, I've been there. I, I was an infill builder. And I'm telling you right now, we got to pay brokerage fees up front. The costs, what they call the soft costs, the cost of borrowing money, your taxes, your insurance, they're all there. They don't stop. So every month you don't sell your house. Your soft costs are eating into your profit. And by the way, the profit margins aren't huge in these deals. They, you know, people think, oh, the guy sold it for a million dollars. He didn't make a lot of money. He really didn't make a lot of money on that profit because of the costs of everything. So now he's carrying the house longer because nobody's buying right now. So he's yeah. got three. Now, on top of everything, these infill builders have three months of downtime. And the market's not going to go like that when the market... So they may carry a house for five, six months more, and they can't do it. That's their profit. That's the profit out the window. And they walk away from the project. In the 70s, 80s, and 90s, they were the, they were the canary in the mine. They were the first ones to go down. And by the hundreds, all over, they went down. In turn mortgage companies and private mortgage lenders. You know how many people are in syndicates getting 10, 11% because they were lending these people, mortgage brokers put them into these deals. And now what's going to happen? They can't pay. So we got mortgage syndicates that are iffy. 
We've got some of the smaller lenders who have a lot of money into these deals. You've got problems, my friend. This is the domino. The next domino, the next one, are the, con are the condo buyers that bought with 10% down and were getting about a two $300 a month cash flow from yeah. an investor, an investor from uh, the tenants. The tenants are going... Well, yeah, I know that quite a few people have bought a couple of properties because they they have a cash flow. They were on the edge, and now since they have not built any much of equity in there, some people put five percent down, bought the property, and they can't pay the mortgage. They they have nothing to, and that's this will exactly have an effect on the lender as well. That's what I'm saying. So the domino effect. You got one, you got two, you got three. Now what happens, these investors that have bought these condos with almost nothing down yeah. and can't get their cash flow, they live in houses themselves or condos and they can't make their mortgage payments now on their own homes. They're in trouble because if the mortgage lender comes after them, they're going to come after them at their house. In other words, we haven't seen the words power of sale in years there's been one here one there one year one there but they haven't been abundant uh, you know what watch <laughs> by the end of this year you are going to see lots of power of sales yeah i i'm hoping the 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 thing that locked down the whole society and economy is right now coronavirus and fear is the one that taken away all the the passion for people to do anything because they're locked up in their houses. But now, it's not just that many people all the have lost billions, billions but, in the stock market, billions. Yeah. So now, <clears throat> now that everybody is locked in, nobody's focused on doing any business unless we have been encouraging other people to think innovation, technology, uh, you know, Zoom, uh, Skype, or, or whatever possible scenario to improve and innovate because uh, now this is the time for them to think about out of the box. Say, how can I diversify myself to do different things to make money and put uh, food on the table? So um, I don't think the government is going to give you for too long. Okay, t let, me, let me say this to you. When the markets crashed in the past, crashed, this isn't a crash, this is a stagnation. In the past, if let's say somebody was in trouble, they could have gotten in and got a job and at minimum wage. Okay? There's no jobs right now. Maybe you can deliver pizza, but that's about it. There's no jobs. Everybody's locked down pretty well. I don't know about you, but I'm not walking out that door unless I have to. When I run out of food, I will go out that door. I was yeah, no, thinking of eating Mrs. Mark or Markovich down the street hall, oh, but... She, I don't think that would be improved. So I think it will be prudent to advise everybody to evaluate their risk tolerance right now because they have the house, they bought the house, regardless of if you are going to purchase and close the house which you already bought. But now what is the risk tolerance for you to maintain and stay in your house? You, uh, and I think it's the time to think about that how can we get a line of credit extra that we can uh, feed the family and support it because you have a built-in equity in the house. So how do you think about uh, helping people to have sort of a, a risk tolerance assessment that how can you survive under this condition for how long? Well, and there's going to be a lot of people that are using up their equity in their homes, obviously. By the way, did you know that one of the largest groups of um, uh, increasing in mortgages are people over 60 years of age, where most people are retired. When I was a kid, everybody retired, and their houses were, they used to have mortgage burning parties. Yeah. Now, they're drawing, they're using their houses as piggy banks. First of all, they, a lot of them are giving their kids $100,000 or something to buy a house. All of a sudden, mom and dad are sitting there right now, and the kids uh, can't pay them back right now. They can't pay them back. So mom and dad, you know that it's something like 40-something percent of seniors over 60 years and 55 have mortgages today, and it's growing. And you know what else is growing? Reverse mortgages. Yeah, that's, that's true. 400% 400 400 increase in a year for reverse mortgages. I think 
is going to apply to senior citizen like me as well. Uh, I am working. I do have a mortgage, but uh, I'm working uh, hopefully a uh, long time and uh, continue to support the kids. So the, I think the best imp advice we can give to our audience is to um, to live well, well below your uh, no, uh, means. That means you have you have an income or you continue to have income to make sure you live below that mean because if you spend all that money, you will have not save any money for contingency like yeah, But it's after the fact now. We're in the crisis now. Now. Yeah. The first thing I'd say also, one of the main things, not first thing, one of the main things I'd say to people is no matter how tempting it is, don't max out those credit cards. Not at 19.9 or 22%. Don't think about it. If anything, this is the time to cut the credit cards or just use it for gas or something, but don't max out the credit cards. I've, yeah, you have no idea. My mortgage brokerage years, how many times I had to bail people out because they kept borrowing, borrowing, borrowing. They mortgaged out their houses. They maxed out their credit. They, they even took loans on their cars. They did everything. It Sometimes, I'm going to say this to you. Anybody listening to me right now, is really at a breaking point. Listen to me carefully. Don't go deeper than you have to. Walk away now. Go see a trustee, make a proposal, because the first cut is the best cut. Get rid of it. Get the monkey off your back. Don't get deeper and deeper, because mentally, it's a horrible game to play. You've got to cut your, your losses while you can. People that are fighting with their tenants, make deals with your tenants. I don't care what it takes. Keep your tenant in the place. You know, I would not give them free rent, but give them yeah. a deal. Yeah. First of all, is a, is a part of the how to survive a recession or recession-like environment is to control your habit of spending money. Because this is the time that you are already in the, in the situation that try to cut down all unnecessary expenses so you have some emergency funds continue to support your activity and putting food on the table and paying with the mortgages and insurance. As you know, realtors are effective tremendously. I do not know uh, that uh, this uh, $2,000 uh, uh, funding is available to uh, realtors because majority of them are independent contractor like me uh, there's other there's other options there but I'll say this to you right now people are listening to us right now that the one of the partners the husband or the wife is a commission earner and the other partner just lost been laid off they don't have the stability of income coming in yeah I spoke to one of my nephews today works for a very large company and um, they're in their um, he's in his um, I'm trying to remember, 28, 30 years old. He's saying that between he and the lady he's with, and his life, his partner, the two of them, oh, they know dozens and dozens of people not being laid off. Yes. And therefore, you know, it's nice to say cut your expense. But what? I'll say this to you. If you've got a basement in your house, and you've got a bathroom, just do everything you can to finish it. Rent the basement. I don't care what it takes. Rent the basement. Do whatever it takes to get through it. The other thing is, too, wish we would never have been here. Uh, people started looking. I'll, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> I don't know about your family. Um, I'll talk about my own son for a minute. When my, when my kids used to buy cell phone, you know what the house down the street sold for? You know what the house just went on for all the time? The house down the street sold for this, sold for that. I know my parents moved into a house back in their days in the 50s, 60s, and they would just go, we bought a house. We live in a house. It's called a home. We reside here. When the time comes, we sell it, we pay off the mortgage, and life is good. Then one day, somewhere in the 70s or 80s, people started looking at houses as investments, their piggy bank. And houses became the speculative idea that's like it, something we lost something along the way. What is wrong? Why do houses have to go up? Well, they did. Now we're paying the price. We're paying the price. Yes. Yeah, the, the, the thing is that um, when things get tough and you you start thinking very seriously about your habits and, and how you 
uh, spend your money and I think uh, everybody is thinking right now and planning accordingly, uh, preparing their budget, uh, um, assessing their position, how can they survive and uh, I was talking to a young lady uh, a few minutes ago that uh, her mother has uh, sold a condo and um, and uh, she, she she has to cancel her listing. Good thing is that uh, she didn't buy the house yet. And uh, potential, I gave some advice about uh, helping and cooperating with the buyer who bought her mother's house just to see if they can help each other. Because we are Canadian, we have to somehow to help each other if, uh, you know, I told her to get a C appraisal done and, and, and see what will happen. Hopefully by that time, end of June, uh, things will get better. Because the biggest challenge that I see is appraised value. I do not know if somebody got the approval now and they're closing in June. Uh, and uh, yeah. how would the bank will evaluate that price at that time and lending the money? Would there be any challenge? You know what's interesting? You said that. Years ago, I'm closing, I won't say which bank, but I w it was a smaller bank. I'm closing on a purchase, and I get a call 10 days before closing. You did not declare your alimony. I go, I don't have alimony, which I didn't. And they said, well, you've you're got an next. I said, my TD and, uh, TDS and GDS and everything is, like, really low. If I paid or I didn't pay, because I my ex and I had a deal. We never had any formal papers. I was paying her. That's all. And I said... What's the problem? If I if it was three four hundred dollars, if a thousand dollars, I'm fine. I'm within my ratios. Um, five days before the closing, they cut off almost a hundred almost a hundred thousand dollars of financing. I had to go to a friend and borrow the hundred right away to close the deal. Five days before closing, not everybody has that ability to get a friend to write them a check to help them out. But I'll tell you, I was pretty angry. And you know the appraisers come in. Four or five days before closing. How do you, you know, you're scrambling at that point. Yeah. No, this is a really challenging time. And, and, and uh, uh, we have advised, we've been advising all the friends uh, to use this time for, you know, uh, rethinking and diversifying, make sure that uh, they are able to make money and try to use technology uh, because uh, this is the uh, only way forward. Like today, we were not able to come to studio, so we are on online uh, through the Zoom. And this is because you weren't feeling. Uh, How bit, uh, stupid good. were we when this first day that we didn't buy stock in the Zoom company? Huh? Yeah. We should have bought stock in this company. Yeah. By the way, if you want to make money right now, did you take a look at how many blue chip stocks are down? Do you wow. really think TD Bank is going to be? It's not a real bank. Is it's one of the world's biggest banks, best banks. It's it's not a buy. Of course, it's a buy. Pure oil. So oil's down. How long? See, the, the, there's buys out there. There's there's fortunes to be made. I, I have an apprehension that uh, since uh, biz, bank is losing a lot of business now because they don't have mortgage deferred payment and. Uh, and no more new business. So I'm afraid that the interest rate go will high. What is your predicament on this? No, I don't agree with that 100% because believe me, I've seen when hundreds of, of properties at a time were walked away from and the bank survived quite well. Yeah. Don't forget, this is Canada. We have an amazing banking system, amazing banking system. Yeah. We're secure. We have a huge amount of CMHC insured mortgages. The fund is solid. I'm yeah. not too concerned. I'm not as concerned. The banks, if people walk away, the bank doesn't take the hit. CMHC insurance takes the hit, and most of it. There's some mortgages that aren't insured, of course. I wouldn't worry about it too much. Yeah, I, uh, sleep. I do not lose sleep over the Canadian banking system. I go, thank goodness for the Canadian banking system. <laughs> but, 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 but they were predicting that uh, the, uh, 2000, uh, 2020, the GDP will rise to 1.8. It was predicted before 3%, and now it's going down to 0.2%. So it doesn't concern you at all? 
because I don't, let me put this to you. Yeah. My own predictions. Yeah. If you predict, if you predict let's come back, let's, let's visit this in one year and yeah. see who's right. Because yeah. I'll tell you this, we, like, again, I'll say it a hundred times over. We have never been here before. Yeah. All we can do is guess, but we know this. We are not coming out of this unscathed. People are into shock. I don't know the next time I'm going to put my hand out and shake somebody's hand. I don't know the next time I'm going to kiss somebody on the cheek or hug them. I don't know how the changes in society are going to be. We're going to look at people. As a child, we used to go, he's got cooties, and play the game. Well, that game came back to bite us in the ass this time. We're going to okay. be nervous. Okay, Barry, you have uh, two, one minute to say the final message uh, if you want to share with the audience before I give my final point. If you're not desperate, don't be this in despair. I have never seen a real estate market that has not come back. It may take years, but it comes back. He, and I'm sorry, not being gender friendly, he who holds always wins. People who hold win. People who dump a despair are sorry afterwards. Hold at all costs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies Thanks, ladies. 10 years. Sorry we were a few minutes late, but I, I appreciate whoever watched us tonight. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, dear audience, uh, it's a great honor to to have Larry Ribot tonight share his thought uh, with you regarding real estate surviving the recession. Uh, I pray for all Canadians and also especially our health professionals. They are on the front line to defeat coronavirus. We pray for them uh, to remain safe and help our citizen. Now, just to before uh, revamp uh, uh, our uh, program, you got, when you have a situation like this, uh, you make sure you have emergency funds available for you to survive through. And you always take opportunity to diversify your skill set so you continue to make money uh, for, uh, for your family and this is the time that uh, you will do that. Major stop, major, major purchases at this time uh, in order for you to survive. And like uh, Barry said, get rid of the credit card debts if you can because interest rates are very high. Most line of credit right now are 2.45. And also fast track your mortgages if you are able to pay to cut down your liability towards payment. So uh, if you are nervous about recession, it's time to reassess your risk tolerance. Make sure that you are prepared because it is already upon us and we have to deal with it. So check your investment asset because I'm not expert on asset uh, uh, allocation, but diversify it. So make sure your, uh, your uh, the investment is protected and ensure if you are working for a company, to so make sure that the, that weather, that company weather the recession. Thank you very much for uh, for watching, and good night uh, from us, Realty Coffee Talk. Thank you very much, and we'll talk to you guys next Thursday at 7 p.m. in Awaz Entertainment. Thank you for watching. Good night. God bless Canada.